I said we needed to do two things. One, we needed to vet the human rights records of countries to keep the worst abusers off of the council. And two, we needed to get rid of agenda item seven targeting Israel. Without those changes, I said the U.S. would abandon its seat on the council. This fight became a story of how hopelessly biased the UN system is. We spoke with over a hundred countries. They all knew the council had become an embarrassment. They said so in private. But when push came to shove, very few were willing to rock the boat. They all talk a good game about human rights, but the sad truth is it just wasn't a priority for them. In the end, the biggest argument was keeping to keeping us, bless you, in America, was that America was the last shred of credibility that the council had. That was all I needed to hear. We withdrew from the Human Rights Council and we never looked back. <laughs> Lots of countries complain about the United States in public. In private, it's a very different story. They know America's voice matters. America must always be the world leader on human rights. That's who we are. We don't need to sit on a UN Council to prove that. On the day we withdrew from the Human Rights Council, I called it a cesspool of political bias. We were right to withdraw. And I will say it again, President Biden is badly wrong to return to it. <laughs> But in all of this, I stumbled upon a genuine love for Israel and America's pro-Israel community. As South Carolina governor, I really didn't have much connection with the community, and I had never been to Israel. But I knew right from wrong. And as governor of South Carolina, we passed the first anti-BDS bill in the country. I was very proud of it, but it was a no-brainer, and it was just common sense. But now going to the UN, that was eye-opening. Have, to have the idea that we have a country like Israel that's a bright spot in a tough neighborhood. It's a great friend to the United States. We share so many values of human rights, democracy, and religious heritage. And then you have the UN, which is dominated by countries that aren't free. They don't respect human rights. They don't share our values. And they bully and bash Israel every single chance they get. If you know anything about my background, you know that that sort of bullying just doesn't sit right with me and that I automatically get my back up. The response and support from this community has truly been overwhelming. Honestly, I have always struggled with your support. You shouldn't have to thank people for telling the truth and fighting for the truth. It should be automatic. It's what our parents teach us to do. People who support Israel should expect no less. Don't ever settle for less than the truth. <laughs> President Trump's record in the Middle East was truly remarkable. From Jerusalem to the Golan Heights, from getting out of the Iran deal to getting into the Abraham Accords, the accomplishments were historic. But now, with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House, we're in a much different place. Our pro-Israel friends in the Democratic Party, and thankfully there's still a few of them, they insist that Biden is not as bad as Bernie Sanders and the squad. I think that might be true. But that's like saying you'd rather have a D than an F. One grade is better than the other, but neither is one to write home about. The Biden approach to Iran is dangerous, and the Biden approach to the Palestinians is terribly counterproductive. Now, I'm not one to lecture a democratically elected government of a U.S. ally. Israelis are fully capable of making their own decisions. They should be free to do what's in their best interest without American politicians micromanaging them from 5,000 miles away. So I'm not giving advice, but I will offer a couple of friendly observations for the new Israeli government to consider. Number one, on Iran, 
I wish it wasn't so, but you cannot count on the Biden administration to stop the Iranian nuclear program. You just can't. You've seen what it did to Afghanistan. You've seen how Biden is falling all over himself to get back into the nuclear deal. The Iranian nuclear threat is existential for Israel. If Israel makes the grave decision that its security depends on removing that threat, it should not wait for an American green light to make that happen. Yes, Israel would be viciously criticized at the United Nations, in the European councils, and in the worldwide media. But so what? In matters of life and death, it is better to be strong and criticized than weak and ignored. <laughs> Number two, on the Palestinians, please remember who you're dealing with. The Biden team wants to get back into the business of giving millions of dollars to the Palestinians and promoting a two-state solution. But we know how that approach ends. Look, we can all have a nice academic debate about the merits of an independent Palestinian state. In theory, it could be a good thing. Lord knows that the Palestinians have suffered too much and they deserve better. But let's be real. There is no universe today under which the corrupt Palestinian Authority can run a state. There just isn't. As for Hamas, they only want a one-state solution, a Palestinian state with no Israel. That's not an accusation. It's a fact. Just ask them. This is a story that's seldom told, but it needs to be told from Congress to college campuses. The Palestinian leadership has never viewed the peace process as a way of achieving peace with Israel. They have always viewed it as a way to destroy Israel. How else can you explain the fact that Israel has accepted two-state solutions multiple times, only to be rejected by the Palestinians every time and followed by violence? If you look at public opinion, there remains far more support in Israel for a two-state solution than there is among the Palestinians. If President Abbas had gone forward with the elections in the West Bank, we know what would have happened. He would have lost to Hamas, a group that openly calls for Israel's complete destruction. This is who Israel is dealing with. Even the Palestinian Authority leaders praise terrorists and teach their children that Israel will eventually disappear. They are not a partner for peace. So when the so-called international community calls on Israel to make, quote, painful concessions for peace, Israel must not be fooled. This same international community will not be there when the terrorist attacks come back. This same international community, joined by its supporters in Congress, will continue to call Israel an apartheid state. The real answer to the Arab-Israel conflict began to emerge in the last administration. The Trump peace plan was the most comprehensive and realistic approach to ending the, dis the dispute between Israel and the Palestinians. It showed that both parties' interests can be served without empowering the terrorists. And the Abraham Accords showed that the Palestinian issue is not the key to a broader Middle East peace. The real key is a strong Israel that defends itself and shows its neighbors that they have much more to gain from their friendship than from their hostility. Peace will come to Israel and the broader region. I have faith in that. As long as Israel continues to show its strength and determination, not in an arrogant way, but in the thoughtful and inspiring way, like it's done so much throughout its history. I have faith that peace will come to Israel because I do know this. You cannot destroy what God has blessed, and God has blessed Israel.
for those of us in this room, we have a lot more work to do. We've got the midterm elections next year where the stakes couldn't be higher. Those elections are about whether we stop socialism, defend our border, return to fiscal sanity, and end the liberal indoctrination in our schools. And yes, they are also about standing strong for our best ally in the Middle East. So I hope you will join me in fighting for victory in 2022. And to my friends at the UN who may be watching, I've got my eyes on you. Don't make me show up because I will. Thank you. For all of you who continue to fight alongside me and show me amazing support, I know I'm too young to stop fighting. My promise to you is this. I will always be the loud and proud ambassador in support of United States and Israel. Thank you for having me here today. God bless you. I love you. And we'll continue to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats. The program will continue.